Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers. Uh, I am not with Chris Bovey, my usual co-host today. He's on assignment, if you will, as we uh, continue on with our Mental Health Week series of podcasts focusing on different aspects of uh, Mental Health Week and, of course, the, the issue of, of mental illness at large. And I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Daniela Holosik, one of our uh, psychiatrists at Ontario Shores. Um, to, to talk, you know, primarily about, you know, what we'll call adult mental health today, but uh, some general, you know, kind of myths and information, myth busting and information about uh, mental health with Dr. Danielle Holosik. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Daryl. Okay. So we're going to start um, just by talking a little bit about uh, kind of mental health awareness and kind of the impact that maybe you've seen uh, in your time in your practice. Uh, we have Bell Let's Talk, we have Mental Health Weeks like this one, we have other kind of awareness campaigns that go on. Uh, have you seen a change in terms of how educated people are uh, in terms of mental health and mental illness when you know maybe they come into uh, your office, so to speak? Yes, I've definitely seen a change. I do think we've made a lot of strides over the last few years, and I think a lot of that is due to um, these mental health initiatives and mental health awareness events um, and definitely getting people to encouraging people to talk more openly about their lived experience. I think that's helped. I'm seeing um, people coming, seeking help more often. I think people are coming for help and asking for help when they're having difficulties, whereas maybe years ago they wouldn't. They're doing more research on their own. So they're coming in already with ideas about diagnoses and treatment options and are sort of asking questions around that. And I, I find that's helping us to engage in more in-depth discussions about the various types of treatments out there. And it allows us to engage more collaboratively in developing like a plan and working towards their recovery. I've also noticed that families seem to be more engaged as well. They're coming and wanting to participate in that treatment plan and be a more ongoing support for their family member. They're doing their own research as well. And that's been um, helpful because they're coming in with great questions. And even more recently, I'm noticing families are, are seeking supports more. They're going to family resource centers. They're signing up for groups out in the community so that they can learn to better support um, the person they care about. And they're even participating in things like family intervention therapies. because They're recognizing that the illness impacts everybody and the way they can the way they communicate can affect um, how the future is going to go. So they learn to talk better to each other. So that's been great. Um, I'm still cautious with um, people doing their research. I do think it's fantastic, but I know many of us go online. That's what we do. We go to the internet. And even though there's a lot of valuable information out there, at the same time, there's a lot of questionable information. And so I just want people to be thoughtful and cautious and whatever they take from there, maybe vet it from a you know, health professional because sometimes there's some very simplistic explanations and solutions for actually very complex problems. Um, and I still think we have a long ways to go in terms of getting the services out there. But we're yeah, heading well, the right direction. Gonna, I just, no, I was just going to say, like, it's kind of um, like WebMD, for example, like when it comes to physical health, you may be having symptoms, but um, it could be a multitude of different issues uh, that you find online. So while information is helpful, um, it's not necessarily to be taken verbatim uh, when you're you know, going through the process. Yeah. I've tried to diagnose myself with medical issues many times on WebMD and mm -hmm. it does not work. So think, yeah, be very careful. <laughs> you mentioned the family piece and I know that Unfortunately, a lot of our patients, or uh, certainly a, a portion of our patient population, uh, don't have family supports. Uh, you know, they they could be in this by, by themselves. But for those who do, if you're, maybe you could talk about how important it is when a when a patient does have family support. How how important that relationship is, and and the impact they can have on on the treatment if there's an involved uh, family with the patient. 
I think it's very important. I mean, it can be very difficult for both. Um, you know, I particularly deal with sometimes a more severe mental illness and we see there's often conflict because somebody, a family member wants someone to get help and they don't necessarily want to get it or the type of help they want, they may not agree on. But in the end, I think when they can work together and collaborate and speak openly with each other, it makes a big difference because I think so, so, social isolation is a big thing for illness and not having people to talk to when there's a problem, not even having people to bounce your thoughts off of, you know, just to, like it, it's going to make things worse. And so when you have someone who's there day in, day out that you can rely on and you can trust, that really helps. They're also there to help recognize when there is a problem. And sometimes when you can't see it, they can perhaps see it. And I think, you know, for everyone, they find out that having um, people in your life just makes you, you healthier. So I think, yeah, definitely having that support and through thick and thin when they're there for the good and the bad, I think makes a big difference. When we talk about mental health today, I think because of the awareness campaigns that we've had, and I'm not, I'm not disputing their effectiveness, but we do talk a lot about, um, you know, depression, anxiety, this seems to be, if you will, like socially acceptable mental illnesses, um, and the ones we talk about anyways, and, and on social media and in the media, but what are some of the other mental health issues that are, that you're seeing that are facing adults uh, today? So, I mean, I can speak about one. I'm not sure it's one of the most common, but we, I mean, where I work, it's common is, is the psychotic disorders, things like schizophrenia. And I think, you know, again, years ago, it was almost taboo to talk about that. If you had a family member who suffered from schizophrenia, we are making some strides to opening the conversation and awareness about that. I think, you know, movies and books like A Beautiful Mind helped with things like that. But um, again, still a long way to go. It's not as socially acceptable, I think, as a term as depression and anxiety. But um, that's something I see a fair amount. I I think, you know, as substance use is another thing that comes up, substance use disorders, whether it's alcohol, marijuana, or other types, you know, I wonder if, as we see more use of marijuana, if there's, you know, there's sometimes association of substance use psychotic disorders, like induced psychotic disorders, is that going to change? Um, so maybe seeing more of that in the future. And some of the other things I think we're becoming more aware of, and you hear people talking about it, is really the impact of trauma on um, mental health. And I think we're starting to be more mindful and sensitive to how, what kinds of trauma people can experience. That it doesn't just have to be one big, horrific, painful event. It can be lots of little events that have been distressing, you know, over years. And these events can occur at home. These events can occur at work. They can happen, you know, sort of anywhere out there. And I think as we start to realize that these things have a big impact, we're, we're starting to turn our heads more to recognizing why some people are struggling out there and trying to find ways to, to deal with that. In, in terms of being, being in the community, uh, living our lives, um, going to places when we were allowed to do those kinds of things, but whether it's a, a, a family member, a friend, um, whoever it may be, what are some of the things that we could watch for that may be... Um, signs that they're struggling with something. We may not know what it is, but signs that they might need uh, some assistance. So I think, again, it always depends on what the issue is in the person. But I, some of the general things that I would say people should usually should look for is sort of a significant change um, in someone's behavior is something that I usually think of. Appearance and behavior. Um, somebody that's dressing differently now or their hygiene or grooming has changed significantly. I think people who seem really distracted um, or withdrawn is something else that you might notice. And they didn't used to be that way. Um, sometimes it's like the colleague that's not showing up for work now regularly, but used to always be there. Or as you say, going out with friends, maybe they're not showing up, you know, or they're coming late and leaving early. Um, or even if we're doing the virtual social events, they're not showing up. I think that's something. Changes in their mood. Um, you might notice that they seem to be more down or more irritable getting into arguments more, um, just anxious all the time and worrying about the same things. And that kind of goes with also their conversation might change. You know, maybe you find that they're talking about the same things now over and over. It's very negative um, or it's very anxious or maybe they're suspicious about things. Um, those kind of things. I think you have to kind of 
take it in context of the situation you're in. You know, is this a big change? Is this a change that's been going on for a while? Or is this just a you know day or two and they're just acting a little different? But those would be some of the general examples I would give. And, you know, so somebody that may not have a background in mental health or be, you know, maybe overly mental health illiterate or mental health literate, excuse me, how would they go about maybe starting a conversation or um, maybe how would they go about helping somebody that is clearly maybe exhibiting some of those, you know, signs and symptoms that you described? Like, how would they go about starting that process? So I think um, I'm probably going to start this with, I like to start with the don'ts, things not to do, maybe. Um, I like to say, don't don't make assumptions. That's my first don't. You know, we don't, you don't know what's going on in somebody's life. So even if you've noticed a difference, you've noticed something unusual, you're kind of wondering, don't suddenly label it. Don't go on to WebMD, as you say, or, you know, internet, come up with a diagnosis and come to them with, oh, this is what I think you have. Go do this. I think you really have to sort of just keep an open mind that it could be a very simple explanation. It could be something very different from what you understand or think it is. I think along with that goes, don't, don't make judgments. I know people may behave in a way that is unusual for you or may do something that you would never do or make choices or cope in a way that you wouldn't, but that doesn't make them bad or weak or anything like that. So I think it's to try to, again, keep that open mind that um, if someone's acting unusual or doing something and, or you try to talk to them and they're not responding nicely, um, just maybe something's going on <laughs> and maybe their way of managing it is just different from yours because they have different vulnerabilities and coping styles. And then I think it's, again, don't be afraid to have the conversation. Like a lot of times people are afraid, but when you do it, be sensitive, be considerate. So examples, I mean, is don't come in again with the diagnosis or, you know, I think you're depressed. I think you need help, but maybe talk about what you've noticed. Like, Hey, I notice. I'll just give examples. Like I noticed you've looked a little down lately or you haven't been coming out as much or um, you just seem to be talking a lot about money. And I'm wondering if like there's is something bothering you or you have you noticed any changes, you know, those kind of things. And I think if you focus on more of those things that are non-judgmental, they're just observations, maybe you can then explore if they've noticed those things as well. And if they're feeling that anything's going on and that can hopefully lead to the next part of the conversation is, what do they think is going on and why? And maybe you can then explore that a bit further. And then maybe if, if you do start to find out that maybe this is something more serious, and then it's maybe talking about what kind of help um, that might be out there, what kind of help do they want? You know, what, what do they want from you? How can you be helpful? But are there other things they can turn to, like some online support, going to their family doctor, um, employee assistance programs, like crisis lines, anything like that? Getting somebody help and then treatment are obviously two different things. And there is a stigma associated with mental health and mental illness, but there's also a stigma associated with the word treatment uh, with a lot of people jumping straight to medication. And I know that medication can be part of a, a, a treatment plan, but it's, it's never just about medication. So maybe you can talk about just, you know, when we're, you know, what, what treatment may look like, you know, it's always like how it's in combination with other things as well, and maybe dispel some of the myths around, you know, you know it being solely about medication. So I think, again, it sort of depends on the, the level of um, illness, the severity of it, and sometimes the type. But, um, you know, I think sometimes, unfortunately, in our culture, when people are moving quickly and you don't have a lot of time for things. Medication is a quick way to make somebody to deal with a problem, right? And um, so I think that's popular for many um, problems out there. But yes, it's definitely not the only thing. Um, you know, we are recognizing, and I think we've recognized it, but even it's being supported by research that therapy is very important and counseling is very important for people um, to help cope with problems. Because a lot of times it's it's not the illness itself, but it's the way we then cope with it and the decisions we make after it that make it worse, you know, and so how to learn to change our thinking and change our, our behaviors to help us work towards recovery. So I think accessing that kind of thing is helpful. A lot of it is lifestyle choices. You know, if you're, you are struggling, you know, we, we use a term in our thing called behavioral activation. We like to say that sometimes when people are feeling depressed, they don't feel like doing anything. 
sometimes you have to force yourself a little bit and say, you know, I don't want to, but I'm going to go for that, you know, five minutes um, and at least get up and do something. I try to use that when I'm trying to exercise. It's like, you know what? I, don't, I can't do an hour, but I can do five minutes, right? So it's it's that kind of idea. And then really it's around that kind of healthy living. Like if you are using substances, try to cut them down. If you are, um, you know, are you eating healthy? Are you eating in a regular way? Like during the day, are you getting a good amount of sleep? Um, are you using your social supports, you know, out there? And talking to people, just sometimes even venting, you need to vent for a little bit, you know, get it out of your system. And then are you doing things that make you happy, doing things that make you calm? So, yeah, those are the other aspects of treatment. We really try to cover it. We also want to make sure there's nothing medical going on that could be contributing. So you kind of want to deal with that as well. As we continue living in the pandemic, um, I think we all, without being able to maybe uh, quantify it, we can all feel like uh, maybe a decrease in our emotional health. Um, collectively, as we've lost, you know, a lot of the things uh, that are normal in our lives and the things that we like to lean on in terms of, uh, you know, to maintain our own health. Have you, do you have any concerns about what, you know, the pandemic and the, um, the kind of consequences of it may have in terms of our, our mental health as a society moving forward? We do. Um, I think I'm, I'm mostly concerned. I think the two pieces I'm most concerned about are on the one hand, social, social isolation. And then on the other hand, like burnout for especially some of those frontline staff and those essential workers out there. So I think the social, social isolation piece is just big because again, we are social beings and we like to congregate. I mean, that's why they have to keep putting in so many rules telling us not to, because we want to. Um, and I think it's really hard for people to, you know, um, as much as sometimes working from home is nice, you don't have to go into traffic, you don't have to deal with other things, there's more flexibility in your day. When you're there day in, day out, and there's kind of no end in sight, um, and you're seeing the same thing constantly, I think there's a, you start to feel a bit more trapped. And I think the sense of hopelessness and helplessness can, can come in. And I think that's going to lead to a lot of people being depressed. I think, again, the anxiety is going to peak because just everyone is worried. You're worried about, there's something to worry about. You're either worrying about the virus and are you going to get infected? You're worrying about the vaccine. Are there going to be problems with the vaccine? Um, you're worried about, um, are you ever going to, like your financial situation, particularly if you want to, you know, a small business owner and you're being impacted by this. So I think there's, there's just worries. Um, I think people are worrying about their kids and their education. Um, everything is just, so I think just starting to, you're teaching yourself to worry constantly. It's something that I think is happening too. So I worry that even after the pandemic, people may not know how to shut that off. And then, as I said too, it's, I think it's the trauma piece. I think particularly, I wonder about people working in general hospitals and seeing so many sick people coming in and people dying, like it, it must be terrible. And having to deal with that all the time, it's, it's gonna be exhausting and it's probably gonna leave a mark. And then I think the other thing I mentioned earlier around substance use, like people turn to substances often to cope with stress. And this is a stressful time. So is it going to start causing substance use disorders? And there are resources out there. Uh, it, like you, you mentioned kind of people at the front lines. I know Ontario Shores has uh, a program for people, uh, for healthcare workers who are experiencing uh, mental health issues and first responders that people can find on our, our website. But hopefully people recognize um, kind of what they're going through and the impact and are able to, to reach out for, for help. I wonder, um, you know, from either a personal, personal or a professional perspective, like we've all gone through challenges in the last like 14 months, whether it's been uh, how, do you, how do you learn to use Zoom or uh, have socially distant gatherings or whatever the case may be. Um, for you, has there been a, a challenge that you've overcome that, uh, you know, during this this uh, unique time in our history? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think I have those challenges that everyone has. Like, I actually, I like going to restaurants. You know, I like going shopping in person, especially when I'm buying clothes. Like, I, I enjoy um, playing sports. That's my exercise, um, team sports. So that's all shut down. Um, and I like going on my vacations, especially in the winter. So I think for me, it's been tough, like really having those things that I used to turn to, to, to keep me well. And in a way they weren't available anymore. 
Um, I think some of it is just kind of, ha- it's, it's sort of an element of acceptance. Like I think initially I was maybe not accepting it and I was just like, oh, it'll pass, you know, it'll a month or two and we'll be over it. I'll just have to ride it out. And I think now I'm starting to, you know what, I don't know when this is going to end. Maybe I need to just start accepting that this could be going on for a very, very long time and I need to stop waiting. So it's about changing my attitude on it. And then I need to start finding other things to do. So really I need to, so those other ways of exercising that I don't love, maybe I need to try them. And that was my example, even for five minutes, you know, give it a try. Um, Okay. I'm going to have to learn the online shopping thing. (laughs) Just, you know, start, start small and give it a little bit, try. And I think really starting to look into activities that I can do at home that I can enjoy. Um, So finding other things that I like. Um, And then I think as everyone's, I feel like everyone's doing this, but trying to make your backyard and your house more your vacation place, you know? So I think those are things I'm trying to overcome more is just really taking those time and doing those things and not just sort of, you know, working, working and stressing and waiting for it to be over, but just living in it, embracing it a little bit. Yeah, I, you really don't have a choice. Yeah. yeah. I think, the, go, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say professionally, I haven't fully, like we struggle, I think a lot with um, access to care out there. It's just really hard because so many things are virtual and everything is slowed down. I haven't really figured out that. I think we just keep advocating, advocating and um, try. I think we try to be more and more creative about solutions for people and maybe utilizing um, families more to provide support and friends to provide support and sometimes people to, to do jobs a little bit outside of their norm, I think is what we've been doing to just make it work. One of the things I, I find interesting during the pandemic as it relates to kind of maybe the growth of uh, awareness around mental health is people in my group, whether it's, you know, like gatherings on Zoom or family members or whatever the case may be, have recognized that they have to take care of their own mental health. I mean, they might not have a diagnosed mental health issue or have a mental illness, but they see mental health now as just something you have to take care of, just like you have to get your heart going to take care of your physical health. And I, I wonder, like, as a medical professional or as a psychiatrist, like, have you seen kind of a, a change in that language, like where we're, we're more, cog- whether it's self-care, like we're more, we're more focused on what we need more than than ever yes i definitely think self-care is the new buzzword like you hear that a lot and people do seem to talk about it a lot just take time for self-care take time for that so i think we also use the word mindfulness a lot now you know people should be more mindful um, about things and i think mindfulness is really about sometimes it's like that stopping and smelling the roses like it's a little bit just be in the moment be present take a breath focus on yourself, focus on the things around you and just be aware of them in a kind of non-judgmental way. And I think that's supposed to help increase your one self-awareness, but also just sometimes pausing your mind from all those thoughts and all those stresses that you're thinking about and, you know, being thankful for what you do have in the moment. So I definitely think those are words that have come out and people do seem to be more aware of that. Well, thank you very much for your time today. It was a really interesting conversation and uh, a lot of things there that I think can help people. So thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.